Hi everyone, so in my last video I found an expression for the minimum speed required for a particle to perform a complete loop around a circular track. So this video is an extension of that, but this time instead of a particle we are going to consider a rolling rigid body with some finite size and the radius of our rigid body is going to be r, it's the lowercase r um, that I've drawn on the diagram there. So I've written in my notes on the screen here that the moment of inertia of the rigid body is i. So that is the moment of inertia about an axis which passes through the center of the object and goes directly into the screen. And I've written i as alpha mr squared. So again, the r is the radius of the object. Alpha is a dimensionless parameter, which can be between 0 and 1. And the value of alpha will depend on exactly how the mass is distributed within your round object. So for example, if it's a uniform solid sphere, alpha is 2 fifths. If it's a uniform solid cylinder, it's a half. And if it is a cylindrical shell, then it's 1. Um, those are the shapes for which it's easy to calculate. But I'm just leaving this as a free parameter so that we can then investigate. After we've got our solution, we can investigate how um, the minimum speed required depends on alpha. So we're also going to make the assumption of no slipping. In other words, there is enough friction between the rolling object and the track to ensure that the rolling object always has just the right angular velocity to make sure that it doesn't slip. So let's start working through this. And I think the easiest place to start is by considering the implications of that no slip condition. Um, so basically what that means is if we have a rolling object, it's going to have some linear velocity, which starts as u, but it's also going to be rotating about its center of mass. So I can draw on like a curved arrow there, label that as omega, and there's going to be some relationship between u and omega in order for no slip to occur. That relationship is u equals r omega. That condition basically comes from the fact that there cannot be any relative velocity between the point on the rolling object which is in contact with the surface and the surface itself. If you haven't come across that idea before and it's not clear why it's the case, then feel free to let me know in the comments and I can do a full video explaining all of that in detail. Now one of the differences between this problem and the particle variation of this problem that we looked at last time is that now our object has two contributions to its kinetic energy. It's got translational kinetic energy and rotational kinetic energy. So let's think a bit about how to write down an expression for the new total kinetic energy. And we'll first consider the initial kinetic energy, just the kinetic energy that it has when it starts its motion down at the bottom. It's got half mu squared from the translational part, but it's also got half i omega squared from the rotational part, because moment of inertia i is like the rotational analog of mass, and angular speed omega is like the rotational analog of linear speed u. So what we can then do with that is combine it with our no slip condition. So we keep the first term as it is, half mu squared. We use the fact that i was originally parameterized as alpha times mr squared. So I just substitute that in. We get half times alpha mr squared, omega squared. But then this r squared omega squared is the same as u squared because of our no slip condition that u is equal to r omega, right? So r squared omega squared is just the same as u squared. So then the nice thing is both terms are proportional to half mu squared. So you can factor that out and write it as half mu squared times one plus your dimensionless parameter alpha. So that allows us to now do our full conservation of energy equation. We are going to take a bit of a shortcut compared with what we did in the last video. I'll take our rigid body, put it at the top of the circle, top of the circular loop. Um, in the last video, I put the particle at some arbitrary position on the circle and considered um, what happens at various different angles. But it's okay to take this shortcut because as long as we can guarantee that our object makes it all the way to the top of the circle and is still moving in a circle of radius capital R, then it's guaranteed to make it all the way back down because the top of the circle is the hardest point to reach. So it's okay to go straight to considering the, uh, the top of the circle. Let's also just mark on everything that we know about the state of the particle at the top. So firstly, it's going to be moving to the left um, tangentially. I'm going to give it a speed of v. We don't know what that is yet, but we will have an expression for it after we do our conservation of energy. We can also consider the forces. I'll just draw the forces on at this stage. You'll have 
a weight acting downwards and you'll also have a normal contact force which is also acting downwards because the tangent to your circle at the top is horizontal and um, your normal reaction force must be perpendicular to the surface itself so it must be acting in the radial direction which is downwards here so you've got this weight arrow mg and you've also got um, your uh, normal contact force which i'm going to call n so let's see what conservation of energy implies we know our initial energy is the expression that we just derived half mu squared times one plus alpha by exactly the same logic we know that the kinetic energy at the top of the loop is going to be half mv squared times one plus alpha right because v would be related to the new angular velocity um, via this same no slip condition so the same logic would apply at the top and how much gravitational potential energy has it gained well it's gone up almost two full radii of the circle but because the object now has a finite size the center of mass of the object is not moving in a circle of radius capital r it's moving in a circle of radius capital r minus small r right so our gravitational potential energy contribution is mg times the height the height is two radii which really means two times big r minus small r in this case because the center of mass of the circle is not doing a full circle of radius capital r we can then just rearrange this to get v squared in terms of u squared so the m's all cancel multiply everything by two to get rid of those halves from the kinetic energy and divide everything by one plus alpha and once you've done that you will arrive at the result that v squared is equal to u squared minus 4g over one plus alpha times big r minus smaller so now we know how the top the speed at the top relates to the speed at the bottom so what can we learn in addition to that by considering the forces on the particle uh sorry not particle rigid body and uh, again, we use the idea of centripetal force, which is mv squared divided by the radius of the circular motion. The radius of the circular motion here, again, it's not just capital R, but it's capital R minus small r. That's the centripetal force. So the net radial force has to be equal to that. Here, your net radial force, we don't even have to do any resolving. It's just you've got a weight acting straight downwards at the top. And you've also got your normal contact force which is also acting straight down so we just add those together and if we want to require that the part that the rigid body makes it all the way around then again the idea is that the normal contact force never quite reaches zero if we want to consider the case where it just barely makes it we can set the normal force to zero and consider the implications of that so let's just write down we're going to consider what happens when n goes to zero at the top then you get that v squared is equal to g times big r minus small r because again the m's would cancel from both sides if n is zero and the rest of this is basically algebra we've got two equations let's call them one and two which both have v squared uh, on their own so we can equate them with each other if you combine equations one and two together then you conclude that g times big r minus small r is equal to all of that stuff on the right hand side of equation one u squared minus 4g over one plus alpha times r minus r then we want to get u squared on its own so let's do that um, we have to move all of that stuff to the left hand side so we can factor out a common factor of g big r minus small r then we get a one plus four over one plus alpha now how does that bracketed term simplify well if you write one as one plus alpha over one plus alpha you conclude that the bracketed term is one plus alpha plus four over one plus alpha which is five plus alpha over one plus alpha right and then remember that was the velocity required the speed required at the bottom in order for it to just lose contact at the top we want to make sure it doesn't lose contact so as long as we're going faster than that then we will be able to complete a, a full loop. So if we just summarize all this, write down our final condition, we will do a full loop. The rigid body will perform a full loop. If u squared is any bigger than five plus alpha over one plus alpha times g times big R minus smaller. So the square root of all of that stuff on the right hand side is your minimum required velocity. So how can we interpret this result well first thing to check is that it's consistent with the result that we got for a particle note that a particle is an object that doesn't have any size if it doesn't have any size then it can't be rotating about its center of mass 
and so it doesn't have any moment of inertia and it doesn't have any radius either so if we set small r equal to zero and also alpha equal to zero because it has no moment of inertia um, then you get that u squared is bigger than 5g times big r which is the same result that we got when we had a particle so this is consistent with what we got before what happens as alpha varies as alpha goes from zero to one note by the way that one is the biggest possible value of alpha because that's what you would get when all of your mass is at radius lowercase r right and therefore all of your mass is as far as possible as it can be um, from the axis of rotation so alpha is going from zero to one when alpha is zero we get five as our prefactor when alpha is one um, we get six on the top two on the bottom and so we get three so that means your minimum required velocity is actually smaller if you have more moment of inertia if you look at a graph of that five plus alpha over one plus alpha as a function of alpha you'll see it's monotonically decreasing as alpha goes from zero to one so it's actually easier for an object with a big moment of inertia to make it all the way to the top so why does this make sense physically well the way i interpret this is that higher higher moment of inertia means that your object is tending to resist changes to its motion to a greater extent right that's what inertia means in general is a tendency to resist changes to its motion and moment of inertia is just the rotational version of that so high moment of inertia means it's tending to retain a greater fraction of the kinetic energy that it started with when it makes it all the way to the top you can see that mathematically um, in equation one basically v squared equals u squared minus all of this stuff as alpha gets bigger and bigger this fraction is getting smaller and smaller and v squared and u squared will be more and more similar so it makes sense that it's actually easier for an object with a higher moment of inertia to make it all the way to the top because it's retaining more a bigger proportion of its initial kinetic energy so that's all for this video next time i am going to be considering the case of an elliptical loop to loop instead of a circular one and so i hope to see you again shortly for that video